I see it is you've got two choices. You can either keep pretending like nothing bad's ever gonna happen to you, and then when it does, you're saying, uh-oh, or you can get ahead of what's coming so that when it does, not if, you're ready for it, and you're sitting pretty, sipping on Mai Tais next to the pool, working on that Caribbean suntan, because you got it covered. So folks, it's time for you to learn the truth about money. It's time for you to take back control of your money so that you are ready for what's about to happen. By doing that, you're setting yourself up for absolute success. No matter what comes your way, you're ready for it. And that's what I want for you, and I wanna help you with that. So go to chrisnoggle.com and sign up for the Wealth Webinar. We do them every Wednesday at 1 p.m., and you need to be there because it's time. For over 90 years, we've been crash testing our cars in the tireless pursuit of automotive safety. At Volvo, safety's been first since 1927. We've saved millions of lives with the invention of the three-point seatbelt in 1959. At Volvo, we've made driving safer for you and them. Visit safety.finleyvolvo.com to learn more. So they say if you give a man a gun, he'll rob a bank. But if you give a man a bank, he'll rob everybody. But the good news for you is Private Money Club runs solely on peer-to-peer -peer relationships, which means no banks allowed. So finally, there's a community for real estate entrepreneurs where it is truly a win-win solution. This community is a place where you can connect with other lenders and other borrowers, and the end results, massive growth for you. You get to build your real estate empire, and you get to do it solving other people's problems. So if that sounds like a place you want to be, well then join us. Go to privatemoneyclub.com forward slash Kelly. And if you want 500 bucks off, just add the code Kelly500 and I'll knock 500 bucks off the premier membership. We'll see you on the inside. Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas podcast where attitude is everything. On today's show, my smile is so big because... I grew up an Oilers fan. If all of you who have been listening to the podcast, rock it with the podcast, you know that I've been an Oilers fan, a Titans fan for my entire life. And you can see the helmet behind me if you're watching on YouTube. You can see the hat. You can see the ball, this ball that's uh, right up behind over the top of my right shoulder. That's a ball signed by Eddie George from the 99-2000 uh, um, season where they went to the Super Bowl and uh, lost by one yard, which I'm still challenging that to the Rams, the Los Angeles or the St. Louis Rams at the time. And that was my brother's team. And I haven't heard, uh, uh, I, I have heard about it since, but I've been reaching out to this young man for three years. And for three years, um, I sent videos, I sent messages, and finally I got a response. When I got the response though, it was at a time when it wasn't, uh, convenient for me. And the reason why is because I was on um, vacation up in Park City, Utah. And so my family and I are up there. I finally get a response after three years of reaching out to Mr. Eddie George, Heisman Trophy winner, one of the greatest running backs of all time, the only other man that has rushed for over 10,000 yards and started every single game of his career was him and Jim Brown. There's only two running backs that were able to do that. So I had been reaching out to him three years, messages. I had been, uh, you know, sending videos saying, hey, Eddie, this is Kelly Cardenas. I, uh, I've been a fan since I was in, uh, six years old. I have a jacket, all these things. And I finally get the call. We're in Park City, so I don't have my studio. And I say to my wife, what should I do? Should I push him out and wait to the end of the season because he's a, a head coach at TSU at Tennessee State University now? And she said, honestly, most opportunity will come in a package that maybe isn't the greatest. And it's not about you having the perfect scenario. It's about you grabbing a hold of the opportunity that's there. Don't let this pass. So I reached back out to his agent. Uh, you know, I, I connected with her and she was amazing, by the way. And it was incredible because um, incredible human being in Eddie and he's a legend to me. I grew up watching him. All my friends grew up knowing that I loved the Oilers, that I loved Eddie George, one of the greatest running backs of all time. And he finally hit me back. And so we got a chance to be able to record. And when I got done recording, um, 
I, I, there was a, a little technical difficulty and I was down that day and I was like, man, I don't know if the recording's going to turn out. And then I realized here I am complaining about being able to interview my hero, one of the biggest heroes in my life. And I'm complaining about a few little things. So it, it's my honor. It's my pleasure. Heisman trophy winner, one of the greatest running backs of all time, an Oilers and Titans legend. And we're going to jump right into the, uh, the conversation that, that had begun. And we were talking about Kevin Dyson, who has been on the podcast also. Um, but this man is an absolute legend. And um, it is my honor, my pleasure. And for me, what I want you to know is, is we're going after every single legendary football player that has played for the Titans, for the Oilers. I believe we're going to be the best, uh, the number one podcast for the Titans and the Oilers, but we're going after them all in the NFL. And if you're out there, uh, Mr. Rice, you got my uh, message today. I messaged Jerry Rice today, and I've been messaging him for about the last three weeks, letting him know that we're going to have him on the podcast too. But it was such an incredible experience to sit down with this legend and one of my heroes in Eddie George because he helped me to realize that life is more than football. I hope you enjoy the show. It's a daunting task to try to find what's next. You know what I'm saying? He, Kevin's done an amazing job of that. Now, now, where do you live? Do you live right outside of Nashville or where are you at? Yeah, I live uh, not too far from TSU. I live uh, in, in Brentwood, kind of Franklin area, uh, about 20 minutes south of yeah. Nashville and uh, been there for 16 years and uh, just been been really overwhelmed by the amount of growth that's happened here in Nashville since my time, since I retired, since I got yeah. here actually, 97 till now. So it's been remarkable to watch. Well, it, 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 it kills me because I've been a fan, man, since six, since I was six years old. So oh, I, got okay. a Oilers, I got an Oilers jacket, Eddie, when I was um, – when I was six, but I think it's because my parents bought it because it was half off because we lived in Idaho and no one uh -huh. liked boilers in Idaho. And, um, and so, you know, I stayed with, uh, stayed with the team, the whole thing. And, uh, you know, I got a chance to spend a lot of time in Nashville actually, you know, during that, during that time. I, yes, I, yes. Well, congratulations on everything with you too, man. And I tell you, like, uh -huh. I, I, I missed the days of being able to see you just run people over uh and <laughs> you know well, obviously. i miss those days sometime too um you know it's it's um that's it never leaves your blood uh yeah the game of football having played it, it I, I love I, I mean i absolutely i've always loved the game uh certainly after i retired my sons played in the game so i stayed connected i co i commentated uh on the game for a time frame in studio radio television you name it um i've done it and now i'm coaching it uh, so in every aspect I, I've done, football has been a part of my, my life so from, the child, from the time I was born till now, I've been almost 50 years. So it's uh, just another uh, aspect of it. And, and, and uh, I just think about the days when I look at my old highlights, I think about, man, I wish I could still go out there and do that. You know what I mean? And uh, impose your will and, and fight with your dudes and grind and go to the grid and the, the, the pains of the summers and the workouts and the hills and, and the, the, the training, you know, just trying to find that edge. Um, I enjoyed that work. Uh, but, you know, now as a coach, I have to do it from a different perspective, you know, a different lens. How, how was that transition for you, too, as far as from – because not every great player turns into a great coach, and you've turned into a phenomenal coach making a, you know, a, a, a huge impact on these kids. But mm – -hmm. How was that transition for you? Um, it's 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 a transition. I mean, every transition that you that you go through in life, it's it's always going to have its challenges. It's going to be tough. It's going to be uncomfortable. And, and that's one thing that you know I preach to my team is that learn to be comfortable, be be comfortable being uncomfortable, be comfortable being in the uncomfortable, and that way you're able to um, you're embracing controversy and you're, you're embracing conflict you're embracing change um and you're embracing adversity and you make it your friend because it's ultimately there to show you what you need to do to be successful that's your teacher so um it's been it's been difficult at times 
daunting at times, exhausting, uh, but knowing that God put me in this position for a specific reason. And the wins and losses um, are a reflection of your culture and what you're building, the talent that you bring in, the energy that you bring every day, the, the, um, the, the standard that you set and that you constantly make that your daily operation is so important. And when you see the mindset flip, that's a win. When you see behavior change, that's a win. When you see kids, you know, that were getting, you know, a two point that had a two point oh GPA, you know, make the dean's list, that's a win. When you see your, your student athletes holding up holding doors for women and uh, treating people with respect, that's a win. Uh, when you see everybody in the same uniform in unison and they're calling each other out, that's a win. So um, on the exterior, outside these walls, people haven't seen the, the wins on the field yet, but I'm seeing them every day within our staff, within our team, within anybody that touches uh, the football program from academics to our sports and conditioning program to uh, the athletic training to training table to even our janitors. Um, it's just a certain energy and expectation that you have when you come up on the third floor of Hinkle Hall where we have our team meeting. So, Eddie, how were you able to uh, exude um, the, the ability and the, the empathy that you have towards the players when you played? And, I mean, you pushed yourself to a complete – I mean, you were a freak of nature. And to be able to see you play 130 games consecutively, every you started every single game, only uh, – Two other people, Walter Payton and Jim Brown, are uh, you know are, are people in that realm, and only one other person in your realm with over ten thousand yards, and one hundred and thirty games started every single game. Right, right. How do you keep empathy though when a kid comes and is like, "Yo, coach, coach, I, I'm I'm hurting a little bit," and you're thinking like you pay, played through some of the um, in the worst injuries that you could possibly, right. and you had some of the 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 craziest defenses on the other side that you were, that you were destroying. It's, it's simple. I was once that kid. I, I wasn't this finished product. You know, there were times when I looked for ways to cut corners and to find a reason to get out of a run or um, when things got tough, you know, shy away from it, you know, get hurt when things weren't, you know, uh, pretend to be hurt when things weren't going your way, pout, all that stuff. You know, I had to, I went through that as a kid. So I understand it. And what you have to continually do is to preach to that, you know, preach to that energy. You have to speak to the rock. You don't bow breed it. You have to speak to it. You have to cultivate it. You have to nurture it. You have to encourage it. It's, it's a daily, again, operation to – that's the fun part. That's your job is to get these kids to realize that, oh, you're not hurt. You just you're – not, you're not injured. You're just hurt. There's a difference. Your hamstrings are, are tight. Your ass is sore. Your your calves are tight. Your feet are hurting. You have a plantar fasciitis. You, your shoulders are sore. And they're supposed to because it's football. This is the work that you have to put in, and you have to embrace that. You know, it's supposed to. That means you're doing the, the necessary work that you have to do. Uh, it means you're doing your job. So uh, it's letting them know it's okay. You'll live. You'll be fine. You know, you have to just trust the process. You have to go through it. Embrace the pain. Um, you know that you're, you're giving birth to a new person and you're molding it, you're shaping it, and that's, and that's a part of the process. So let's talk about that, that, do, that new birth because going from high school, I want to take us back, because going from high school, going into college, every kid in high school that maybe had a good game or two good games mm -hmm. uh, thinks, hey, I'm going to college and then I'm going straight to the league. Can you take us through that progression? Because, I mean – you, you experienced it at the highest level, um, but what about to those kids out there that are in high school right now? What are some of the things that they can do to get themselves prepared to be able to go to that next level? Well, some of the things that they should be doing is, one, you know, taking care of their academics. Um, the more that you can be a great student, the better. You know, that catches a coach's eye because, one, it tells you a couple things. He's eligible to play. Two, that he takes care of his business. Um, a student is doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily book smart. It's the ability to put forth the effort to get better. You know, you're prioritizing your time. You're studying your you have to study. You're you you're you're accountable in that area. You have a sense of responsibility 
as a student. So it tells me that, okay, if I'm recruiting this kid, I don't have to necessarily worry about if he's going to get in his playbook or if he's going to show up on time. There, There's two type of guys I like to say. Are you familiar with, uh, you know, um, uh, terms like um, FIFO and LIFO, you know, first in, last, first oh, out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Left out, right? So um, here at Tennessee State, I have a, you know, a finance background, and I, I, I see either an asset or your liability, either adding to and appreciating value to yourself, to this program, or – your liability, you're taking away. And uh, the, the guys that are, are high-level guys, that are high-energy guys, that are assets, that call them Philo, your first in and last out. That's what you want to be, your first in the building and last to leave in everything that you do. If you're labeled as a LIFO guy, a last in, first out guy, you're a liability. You know, so it. So that's 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 what we try to do in, in this. It's in just treat, create that culture that it's it's cool to get great grades. It's cool to um, uh, be a great person. It's cool to come in and study and learn and grow and learn about the game of football. And uh, you know, just from a recruiting standpoint, um, that's what we try to do. You know, try to find those type of guys. So let's let's fast forward. I'm gonna I'm, we're gonna fast forward. We're gonna come back because uh, you know we're gonna talk about Ohio State, but we're gonna talk about the most important team in sports, uh, which is which is the Titans and Oilers. And yes, so yes. you come you come in in '96. You get Rookie of the Year. Talk to us about the transition coming from. I mean, you were you averaged 5.5 yards per carry during your uh, Ohio State career, which is unbelievable. Um, a different game at that time too, because it was dependent on the running back but you come into the league what are the adjustments and what are some of the things that maybe shocked you or was there even anything that shocked you when you came into the league well um the speed of play on the offensive and defensive line just how fast they were you know you, you, in college it was you know the holes opened up and you know it was time but in, in the league it's this that's that's an open hole and it, it took time for my eyes to, and, and my legs to catch up to that speed, you know, especially in, in mini camp, because you had offensive linemen and defensive linemen that were just as quick as you. And that was eye opening. But once I got used to that, settled down, found my rhythm, that, that slowed down. I think the biggest adjustment, I know the biggest adjustment is off the field, it is, it is managing your time. You have money now and you have time, you know, um, and what are you going to do with that time? You know, are you going to go out and, and, you know, chase women? Are you going to go to clubs? Are you going to gamble? Are you going to, I mean, those, there's a time and place for all of it, but your number one priority is taking care of your body. It's uh, taking care of your business, staying in your playbook, you know, staying focused, making sure you get off to a strong start um, and all those things. So that was the biggest adjustment for me was the off the field versus on the field. So you constantly dealt with press. Not as much as press as I would like to have because I don't believe that the uh, Titans ever get the type of exposure uh, right. that, that we need. And I say we because I feel like I'm a part of the team, Eddie, and I feel like right. you and I are teammates and we've been there. Um, but with all the press that you dealt with, what do you – because most of the time when I listen to interviews afterwards, after the game, or at halftime, They'll ask you the exact same thing, and it's almost, I almost feel bad for you as a player because you, they got they ask like, "What are you going to do in the second half to adjust?" And you're like, "Well, we're going to you know execute, and we're going to you know we need right. to do." And it's it's canned. What do you wish that the people would have asked you so they would have known the real Eddie? At, at any particular time. Um, um, let's 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 go rookie season. What do you wish that they would have asked you that 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 you never really got asked to be able to tell your story? Oh wow, um, God, that's a great question. Um, I guess it would be you know what if I were a color, what color would you be? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I would come back and say I would I would be purple because it's the it's the, it's the color of royalty and. And richness, it's rare, it's it's deep, you know, something along those lines. I mean, because you get asked about the same questions, how do you think the team's going to look? You know, what what do you think about the offensive line changes? 
Um, Steve McNair is coming off an injury. Does it put more pressure on you? I mean, what about the passing game? You guys need a receiver. The stretch. Yeah, we, we, I get that. You know, I think we all understand, you know, what we need to be successful as an offense and so forth. So I think just more fun questions in that regard. Um, uh, and I've been asking really good questions in the past. So uh, it, was, it hasn't been all bad. What about the biggest rivalries? We all know about one rivalry. One of my friends, uh, you know, when she found out that I got a chance to be able to have you on the show, um, she's a big Ravens fan, which, you know, I, I don't even believe they should be in the NFL anymore. Um, but uh, there, was a, there was a huge rivalry there, and there was a rivalry with one particular number, 52, that was some of the greatest football in the history. Can you talk about that part? Because I remember my favorite highlight of you is when you picked him up with your stiff arm and put him to put him to the ground. Now I send that to my friend all the time, but was that probably your favorite rivalry? Um, well, truth be told prior to the Ravens, it was Pittsburgh because we go back to the Houston Oilers days, Pittsburgh Steelers was probably the number one rival. It was Pittsburgh. week. Everything was, when you played Pittsburgh, it was a different type of preparation. You knew you had to bring your hard hat, your lunch pail and, couple bottles of uh, aspirin because it was going to be a physical day from both sides. You know, both teams pride themselves on great defense, a physical defense, and a physical run game. And uh, the score might be three to nothing, six, three, nine, three, you know, not a lot of touchdowns were scored in those games, but it was a bloodbath. Um, And I know that coming into my rookie year in Houston, that was preached. Um, throughout the organization and through the week. So as time moved on and we split divisions and we became the Titans and we moved to Tennessee, um, we started beating Pittsburgh on a regular basis once we became the Titans. And then all of a sudden we get Baltimore as a nemesis. They got really good during that period in time, you know, with Ray Lewis and so forth. So, we became um, bitter rivals, and it was we hated each other. Both organizations, the coaches hated each other, the staffs did not like each other, um, and it was it was not a game. It was literally, you know, all, with all respect, it was warfare, and that and that was understood going into that game. It was body bags, as we would say, and um, we got pulled out on the gurney that day. That was that was the intention, and 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 we left everything out in that football field. So take us to the 99 season, Eddie. Um, 99 season, uh, it, it, it ends in a, in a bitter rivalry, not just for you, but for me, because my brother is a Rams fan. His name is oh. Rob. If you, if you could give Rob, give Rob the business real quick about being a Rams fan, if you could, if you could do it, Eddie. Well, I can't. I mean, they got the rings. You know, it's just tough. But, hey, you know, I, 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 uh, I wasn't as devastated about the game I think there were other games that hurt me more. Uh, just how close we were probably is the, the one part that um, eats at me the most because we were close to tying that ball game and possibly going into overtime. Um, and to have the opportunity to play for a Lombard, Lombardi trophy uh, doesn't come around often. You know, uh, Tom Brady is an anomaly to have seven rings. You know, played for. You know, he spent half of his career, well, more more than half of his career, uh, in the playoffs. You know, and and competing for. It. So that's remarkable. So I only had an opportunity to play in it once. You know, we competed uh, in a small window. You know, we had been to two AFC Championship games, uh, a Super Bowl, a slew of playoff games, and it's it's tough to get there and it's tough to win. Um, just getting there is, is such a, uh, is an honor in itself. So, uh, I, I can't say too much about the Rams. I mean, they were a great, <laughs> they, just, they were dominant, man. And to have the opportunity to, um, to compete on that level and, and turn that game around because it could have got away from us easily down 16, zero to tie it up and to beat them up in the second half was, was a valiant effort on our behalf. What do you wish people uh, knew about that 99 season or any season um, that, that the normal fan doesn't understand? Because we all have the tendency to sit back and say, I would have done this. I, I, I saw this and I, I can't believe they did this. But what do you wish the fans would know about the game 
and whether it be about the 99 season or, or any season for that matter? Well, it's, it's not what you see on Sundays. It's everything you see leading up to that Sunday. It's the preparation, the attention to detail, the workouts, the, um, the shift of mood. You know, after losing a game, you know, because you pour so much into it, uh, from an emotional standpoint, spiritual standpoint, that you have to bounce back and recover and build yourself back up, build your confidence back up in the game plan that you want to go back out there and do better and find a way to win a ball game. Um, it's 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 this the preparation that people don't see or appreciate. You know, all they see is the finished product on Sunday, and yeah, they have all the answers. Well, you know, you, you would have done this and that. Well, no shit. You know, you're at home watching, you're a spectator. You know, you go in the heat of battle and they don't understand that, you know, you're working through a ding you're in terms of you're trying to get your head clear after getting the shit knocked out of you and you've got 30 seconds to respond or you whipped off a big run and you're trying to catch your breath and you just, okay, you got to muster up the, the strength to the lineup once again and give it that, that, that next rep you're on. Those are the things that are tough. Fighting through injuries. I mean, I remember when I had a toe uh, situation, and it was a turf toe. And if you need, if you play sports, the toe is the most important part of your body because that's where your explosion comes from, your balance, everything. You're 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 you're, you're twerking a lot of weight off off of that one toe. And people are like, well, it's only a toe. I'm like, well, yeah. Why don't you lose one and find out just how difficult it is to take on a defense. And to, and to cut and to, to sprint with confidence, pain-free, that's no joke. And I played, you know, the, my, the, my, the whole uh, 2000 season that way, which is my best season. Um, ba- barely practiced during the course of the week. Uh, got surgery the following year, which was another tough year. So two years back-to-back, back, you know, was, that was, from a, um, a mental standpoint, a very rough year for me. Uh, so people don't understand, you know, the, the Monday to Sunday ritual routine, what you go through, get prepared for on a daily basis. And I really appreciate it. And I, I can't I can't blame them because there's no other um, sport that 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 you have to do that for other than hockey or maybe basketball. You know what I'm saying? From a physical standpoint. Eddie, when you came into the league, what was the first pinch me moment for you? Because you know, you were playing college, you were, you know, growing up watching people play, and then you came into the league. Was there a pitch me moment, or did you did you realize that the people that were around you were fortunate to be able to see Eddie Eddie George? No, I there was always a pinch me moment. Uh, every day that I got out of bed and had the opportunity to play the sport that I loved and got paid for it uh, was a pinch me moment. Um, then we fall into a flow and um, you begin to see the fruits of your labor. And that's a, that's a really a pinch me moment. Um, it all was. Again, I wasn't highly recruited. Um, I got to Ohio State by, um, by a blessing. Um, got drafted. You know, my entire career, my entire life, I was always the underdog. That was, that was me. And I always had that chip on my shoulder. And that's the energy that I brought with me every single day to every single workout was I have something to prove every day. I have to fight for everything I had. So um, it was all a pinch me moment. It wasn't, I never walked in and said, hey, you adjust to me or I'm I'm a Heisman Trophy winner and, um, you know, you need to recognize. No, I never, I never was like that. I always was looking for um, the next level the next best thing in terms of getting, getting better every day. How do you keep that chip from becoming an edge that causes people to almost repel from you? Because I want to tell you a quick story. I got a friend named James Dixon. Uh, James Dixon is a a unilateral um, amputee. And I was talking with him last night, one of my great friends, one of the top motivational speakers in the world. And I told him that you were going to be on the show today. And when I told him, he said, oh, yeah. He, that's that's the guy. And I, I was thinking, oh, he's an Oilers fan. He's a Titans fan. He said, no, no, no. He said, when the, the Eddie that, that people don't see, when people aren't watching, he said, I got to see that guy. And to be able to see his humility, his integrity, 
And that is the reason why I think that guy is so solid because of the way you were actually traveling with an amputee when he met you and he got a chance to be able to talk to you. Now, how does a person, because a lot of times when that chip is there, that chip becomes an edge that causes people to like repel. But you, not only in your coaching side, but on the team, you talk about culture, bringing those people into the culture and you're the example of it. How do you balance that part? Oh, it's all honestly. Um, I don't. I don't balance it. It's just. Uh, it's a God. I rely, I rely on my relationship with God. It really is. Um, every step of the way, I, I truly relied on, on my faith. You know, there are four pillars that I operate with in my life that I constantly focus on, on a consistent basis. And you know, that's my physical pillar. You know, working on me physically, trying to stay physically fit. A healthy, whole, and strong, get my rest, and all of that stuff. There's a social element where I'm making sure that I'm not the smartest guy at the table or the smartest guy in the room. If I am, then that's a problem. You know, I want to have good people around me, great mentors, great people, great coaches that can add to the culture and help build it and help build me. Um, and I can learn from as well. And that can be anything from business to coaching to football. Um, there is the uh, mental aspect of it in terms of uh, mental health, you know, being mentally clear, um, you know, having the championship of, of the mindset of a champion, and that's to be excellent in everything that you do and that there's a higher standard. And what you're constantly telling yourself and what are you putting into your mind, what are you reading, what are you listening to, and you believe it or not, all of that stuff has an impact on your whole being, your whole aura, your energy, your your focus, your thoughts from moment to moment. So if you're just looking at a, a little bit of porn, you know, it's it that will come out and come up in some ways in, in, in the dark. So you have to be very conscious of what you're watching on a consistent basis. And even the stuff like from, um, you know, uh, reality TV and garbage TV, you just got to be conscious of that. Um, and then there's the spiritual element, and that's the, the part that I'm talking about, is that's the, the center of it all, is finding your purpose through Christ, it's having a relationship with God, and uh, finding your path to God, and recognizing that it comes from a higher power, and spending time with your spiritual being, and your, your spiritual self, and nurturing that through scripture, through um Bible plans through a group of good people at the local church or a Bible study or whatever that is. It's, it's not about religion. It's about a practice. And, and that, to me, has always been something that I've continued to develop. So you asked the question, and I know I'm going around the world, but um, it's because of my faith that I've been able to um, navigate in that way. And try to find a balance. It's not like, hey, I have a system, it's all me. No, 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 it's not. It's not me. Yeah, I can't take credit for that. It's it's relying on that intuition, the spirit, the spirit of discernment, um, the spirit of discipline, you know, my experiences, the ability to listen and to respond and, and, and praying that you're making the right decision in that moment. So, Eddie, let's talk about that, that as far as the relationship with the Lord, too, because you know, we were just talking about this in our men's group recently. And uh, we, we set it up in kind of a circle. I was sharing with the, with the crew, and what got opened up to me is that uh, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, yeah? And then when you, uh, when you fear him or respect him, then he gives you wisdom. Then he gives you knowledge, but he wants you to get knowledge of him. Once you get knowledge of him, he'll give you understanding. When he gives you understanding, then he'll give you insight. When he gives you insight, he'll give you discretion. When he gives you discretion, he'll give you discipline, and that discipline will lead you back to the fear of God. You just yes. talked about that discretion and that discipline, a lot of times people have a, like a paradigm shift in their life. Something happens. And then like my dad, I joke with him all, uh, would joke with him all the time. I call him pop. And I would say, he would, he will, he would tell me, he would be like, boy, I found Jesus. And I was like, I didn't know he was lost pop, but <laughs> my, my pop in 1984, 85, he found Jesus, right? Was there a shift for you, or was this just something that was raised and ingrained in you from a, from a kid? Hey, how you doing, man? How you doing? I'm doing an interview right now. Give me one second. 
Um, yeah, um, I think it it was definitely something that um, was something that's always been ingrained in me. Um, my my grandmother um, was a church going woman. Um, she's ninety four years old. Believe it or not she still gets on her knees and prays every single night. Wakes up in the morning and prays um, with her Bible at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, in the middle of the night when she can't sleep, she gets on her knees and she prays. And that's something that I grew up watching her do. I saw the power behind that. She prayed for, she has a Bible this thick. She has the pictures of all her children, all her grandchildren in the Bible with different scriptures. Very intentional about it. So I used to hate going to church. Never really enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, but I think over time when life happens, you know, you, you go back to what what draws, what, what you get strength from. And, and, and that's that's been it for me. It's been a process. It hasn't ever been a, a, a moment of, oh, man, you know, I'm doing this and I turn back. No, I've had moments where I prayed and I revert back to my old way, relying on my own strength and doing things I, what I want to do and uh, doing things that I think is going to bring me joy to coming back. So it's a constant battle of, of that. So I'm spending more time doing what's right versus seeking out to do things my way and taking me off that path. So that's, that's been it. It's just been a process. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm a Christian, but I still cuss, you know, so uh, I'm a work in progress. How about the transition from going from one of the uh, most uh, heralded um, players in the game to the retirement side? Because this is something that a lot of people don't talk about. I mean, like you'll see someone come on as a commentator and you'll just be like, oh, wow, they just transition into that or they go into coaching or whatever it is. But no one really sits with the player that, I mean, you literally were at the pinnacle, the absolute pinnacle of professional sports. When you're a kid and you're thinking, hey, I'm going to the league, you didn't even only go to the league. You won the Heisman. You won Rookie of the Year. You go to the Super Bowl. You play for the greatest team of all time. Talk to us about that transition and things that people don't realize when you step out of the league or you retire. Um, it's not about a job. It's, it's, it's a purpose. Um, you play the game of football and you begin to find your purpose through that. It's, it's not about finding a commentating job or jumping into wealth management or going into acting or um, going into coaching you know, as a uh, means to an end, it's now you're at a place, you've, you've grown and evolved to a place where you um, have to get back and it's a purpose now. You're now a vessel. You know what I'm saying? Um, all the wars that you've gone through, all the experiences that you experienced in that particular job has prepared you for the next thing to help someone else and to impact others. And that's that to me is the, the key to it all is to understand there's a process to it and to be willing to go through that process to be willing to go back to step one and to learn a new profession a new skill that's going to enhance your purpose and, and most guys um, fall prey to that it's and, and, and they rely on hey I'm going to talk about my old days. I'm going to live off my old accomplishments. I'm going to live off and talk about the old stories of us in college and, and professionally speaking and, and show no growth in those other areas. And that's to me, is a dangerous thing because that's when you find guys searching for fulfillment in the wrong areas. And that's when depression sets in and you become dependent on, on substance abuse and on women or gambling or you're finding another vice to fill a void because where there's no void you know the something of something against god evil negative energy or the devil can fill that void so you've got to spend time you know whatever that void is fill it up with positivity fill it up with christ fill it up with con constructive behaviors constructive thoughts 
um, and and be diligent in searching and asking for your purpose. And that's that's the key. And it's not it's not easy, you know, to go from being a football player who's played at the highest level to anything in life and finding what's next is going to be difficult. You know, same thing for you know Tom Brady. He won seven rings, who's made a, almost a billion dollars in contract money. Um, finding that next thing, that, that sense of fulfillment, is going to be a process for him. What about the state of the NFL uh, today? Because I've been watching a lot, and running backs don't seem to be getting the love that they used to, where you're seeing high-level, I mean, franchise running backs not even getting a contract or being in a place where they're getting franchise tagged or having to possibly sit out. How, like, what's your view on that state you know, in the NFL today? Well, uh, the position has been devalued. Um, you can clearly see that in the, the contract values. Um, the run game itself is still of value. The game right currently right now is quarterback centric. It's throwing the ball a little bit of yard. It's investing in wide receivers, uh, hybrid tight ends. Uh, we're on the defensive side, it's everything that impacts the, the passing game. It's pass rushers, it's, you know, hybrid uh, linebackers, safeties, corners. Um, and, well, to, to, without going into a long-winded uh, answer, um, my, my thoughts are cyclical. I think it'll get back to that at some point. Um, there'll be more balance in the offense. And, you know, it's unfortunate that guys like Saquon Barkley, Derrick Henry, um, uh, guys that I've just mentioned that the Josh Jacobs, they're, they're not getting the love that they deserve, but this is where the market is. It's, it's the business of, of professional sports. And they've got to understand that, you know, there's not a lot of wiggle room. You don't have a lot of leverage because the last couple of backs that signed big contracts, Ezekiel Elliott, Todd Gurley, their production after the contract was not high standing some guys got hurt they weren't quite the same they weren't the same game breaker and now what you're finding is you can go and find backs in the seventh round sometimes free agents that are just as effective and you you can get a, a bevy of running backs that complement each other with different skill sets versus having one guy you're going to pump money into and that's it and that's going to have a short career running backs have the shortest career out of, out of any position in the NFL and um, and it's reflecting that. So, uh, yes, we impact the game in a major way, but how long of an impact that is is the key, you know. So, uh, you, I mean, in the next couple of years, unfortunately, you'll probably see, you know, Derek, um, you know, make a move because of his age, the amount of carries he's had. Um, that's the nature of this business, and that's how they kind of look at you. You know, they don't want to necessarily continue to pay a high dollar value in a guy that's only going to depreciate in value, you know, in the future. So it's, it's, um, it's business. And hey, let's talk about some of the, the hard knock lessons. Like a person was asking me the other day and, you know, my, my pop, uh, who I speak about all, all the time, um, he was a character and people are like, oh, are you so thankful that your dad put a, um, a Walkman uh, headphone in your pillow and made you sleep teach from the time you were in fourth grade to the time you were in sixth grade on personal development tapes. And this is what we had to do. And my oh, brother did it too. And they were like, do you thank him for that? I'm like, nah, I didn't, I was so mad at the time, but now I'm, uh, I, I'm very appreciative. Let's talk about some of those hard knock lessons that you, that you learned that at the time you were like, this sucks, but now you look at it and it helped you in your journey. No, I mean, I could pinpoint to a few. Uh, the moment I had to go to, to Fort King Military Academy when I was in high school. Um, that was the best move my mother ever could have made. Uh, didn't have the money, necessarily the money to send me there, but she found a way, uh, changed my life. And, and there I was able to um, read books like Think and Grow Rich, um, listen to um, various motivational speakers. My, my uncle was sending me tapes um, on that, the state positive, the power of positive thinking, um, having a relationship with God, all of that, my faith, everything. Um, the years that I was at Ohio State, I fumbled twice in the goal line at Ohio State as a freshman. Never to see the field again until my junior year. Um, only to overcome all of that uh, to win a Heisman. And 
then come to Tennessee or Houston. Uh, a vagabond football team with no identity moved to Nashville to create, you know, what we have now, the Tennessee Titans, um, to retire, to, you know, find my my path now as a head coach, you know, went into acting, got my master's in my business, got an MBA and um, a master's in business, uh, fellow uh, school of management, um, started my wealth management business, you know, have my sons, you know, who are very successful now, one is playing for me. My, my oldest son is graduated from USC film school and he's doing some amazing things in, in the film industry. So um, I've seen it throughout my entire life that you know, the impact of, of powerful thinking and constantly staying diligent and making this a lifestyle, not just a bunch of words that you read and, you know, in your interviews and using these, but you really live by it, it becomes you, you know. So that's that's been uh, very impactful for t- for to me. Eddie, with the when you talk about your relationship with the Lord, you you alluded to you know reading the Word, things like that. When I remember as a kid looking at a two thousand page book, I was like, I, it almost paralyzed me because I didn't know where to start. Where would a person start to read, or like maybe some of your practices to help you to be able to understand the Word on a different level? That's a great question. Uh, still something I'm searching. I think the best way to start um, for me is I started with like little plans in my Bible lab, but then I'll just, um, I love the book of Proverbs. There's so much wisdom in the book of Proverbs. Um, uh, I, I love it. Uh, I try to read it once a year. You know, um, I think there's 31 books in it, I believe. And uh, I take a month that has 31 days in it and spend a day, you know, reading one book a day. And that's a great way. I'll start with the book of Proverbs with wisdom. Um, then I like Ephesians as well. Uh, there's so much wisdom in that. Um, uh, the Psalms is, is amazing. You know, written by David, you know, the book of Psalms, you know, the songs, and uh, so much beautiful, rich language and the imagery of what God is creating. And just you can hear David's cries, you can hear his fear, you can hear his doubt, you can see. The shifts of, of, of him going from fear to confidence in one paragraph, so that that resonates. So the the Bible is uh, it means something different every time you pick it up. You know, uh, what it meant to me, you know, ten years ago means something different to me now. It's it's peeling back the layers, and you're being able to see with the spiritual eye. You know, when you really spend time in in the Word. So, you know, life life and death are in the power of the tongue. You know what I'm saying? And words shape your future. They shape your your um, they shape your dreams. They shape individuals. They can destroy individuals. So you have to be mindful of how you speak and what you speak out in the atmosphere. So Eddie, this, I'm, I'm a, a master at transitions, and I don't believe anyone in the world has ever transitioned from talking about the Bible to talking about Dave Chappelle right afterwards. But there was a, a a, 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 a skit on Dave Chappelle that was um, Charlie Murphy's True Hollywood Stories. And does Eddie have any true NFL stories that would make us fall off our chair? Oh, man. Oh, God. <laughs> um, man. Uh, I think... Uh... <sighs> One that comes to mind um, was uh, in 2001, two-ish, around that time, um, I was uh, making a transition from becoming a, a, an Adidas guy to a brand Jordan guy. And long story short, this was Michael Jordan's 40th birthday party, and, and he was playing in Washington, D.C. at the time. He was at, with the Wizards. And um, we come in to get invited to his party. We go to this party. My wife and I, or my girlfriend at the time, was my wife now. Uh, and we go in and we see a who's who. You know, President Clinton was there, Derek Jeter, Ray Lewis, uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce, um, of course, Michael, Scotty Pippen. I mean, just uh, who's who. Uh, uh, Tim Hardaway, uh, 
actors, musicians, all there to celebrate his 40th. So I was like, man, this is, I'm floored and I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I mean, it can't get any better than this. Well, that night, we're all staying at the uh, Four Seasons Hotel. A huge snowstorm comes in, so nobody can leave. We're all snowed in. And it's like, okay, well, what do you do? You know, we got to go down to the bar, we get some drink, we see some people, we're just socializing. And I see a couple of uh, the Brand Jordan executives downstairs, and they say, hey, we're going to go over to Michael's spot and uh, go eat and, and socialize. And why don't you come on up? I'm like, oh, bad, let's go. So I'll go upstairs, and... Uh, and as I approach the door, I hear music, laughter, you know, all this going on, this, this, this big buzz happening. Open the door. And I bought Mike a gift. You know, I was uh, he's a big wine drinker, right? So you got him um, like 40 bottles of different wines from all over the world. And I thought it was a special gift. Like, he's really going to appreciate because this is different. So I walk in, I see at least 15 baskets of wine. But I was like, ah, oh, man. So it's like, okay. It's like, damn. All right, we, 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 not, you're, not, you're not special. So I walk in. I make a hard right. Charles uh, Oakley was in the kitchen, you know, frying chicken, making macaroni and cheese, yams, greens. He's cooking up a storm. I'm like, oh, this is a nice little spread. And to the right, you know, uh, Beyonce sitting there talking to Kelly and having a good time drinking. And then I walk in, and there's this table, this huge long table with all these guys around it. Michael's at the head, Jay-Z spy aside. There's a few other guys around the table and this big pile of money in the center of the table. Had it been about $5 million in cash. And they're, you know, playing who's who. They're playing poker. They're playing uh, Blu-ray. They're playing all types of card games. You know, dealer's choice. And I'm like, oh, wow. They say, hey, Ed, you want to get in on this? I'm like, Nah, I'm good. <laughs> I said, nah, I'm going to go to the little boy's table and, you know, stick to my $500 game. That one right there is a little little bit much for me. And um, I knew then that, man, this was – that was an amazing story, you know, just to be able to see um, Jordan and some of the guys that we admire in, in sports and entertainment all together just being people, just being individuals. It's a lot of fun. So I would be remiss after that story not to ask you because my son has the answer. He, he answers this all the time. But in basketball, Jimmy the GOAT. Well, the GOAT to me is Michael Jordan. Um, having, having the ability to watch him play uh, live and growing up, the story, you know, him being counted out, not being getting kicked, not – uh, being able to make the, the basketball team, being too short, battling his brother. I mean, he overcame so much, and to become what he became, you know, was just remarkable. Um, you know, six foot, what, six foot six, uh, you know, was a around the rim guy, known as a dunker early in his career, to morph his game into a deadly uh, assassin on the, on the perimeter, you know, passer. You know, went from being somebody that was a scorer, kind of selfish, to buying into team. And that's when you saw the championships happen. He had to go through, you know, some monster teams, the Pistons, the Celtics, to get what he wanted. It took him seven years to get that first champion or nine years to get that first championship. And it was a process. You had a chance to watch and appreciate the process of hard work and dedication. And he didn't leave in free agency to go find somebody else to win the championship with. He he made guys around him better, but more importantly, he decided that I need to um, be selfless and have a sense of oneness and unity and learn to love my teammates to ultimately get a championship, something that eluded him in his earlier in his years when he was just a scorer. So that, to me, the story – is, is better than just the numbers that he put up, the championships that he put up, the, the sense of humility that he has. Um, he's not perfect. You know, I'm pretty sure, you know, Mike's been called an asshole and all kinds of things. You know, it's tough to deal with as a teammate and all of that. But, 
you just appreciate that now just being a coach and, 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 and now, you know, having gone through it myself, you, you honor that. You, you embrace that. But, you know, to me, that that's what makes him the GOAT in my mind. How is it uh, filming in the Heisman House? Oh, it's fun. I've been doing it the last guy, maybe, oh, what, 13 years? Uh, off and on every other year or so. And it's it's really uh, a Heisman house when you get around all your Heisman brothers and see how they're doing and you crack jokes and you take films of them sleeping. And, you know, uh, it's just awesome, you know, when you, you can be around the guys. And it's really a family. Uh, one, one year that sticks out to me um, was – uh, when Herschel was there and Matt Liner was there as well. And Matt has his had his younger son or his son there. He was young at the time. And in between takes or in between commercials, uh, Herschel was in the corner showing Matt's son how to color in, 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 the, in, in the white lines, in between the lines. And that was that's like an endearing, special thing. You don't necessarily see that. Or to have the interaction of, uh, Heisman winners just talking about their families and golf games and shooting stuff. Um, this past year it was really cool to watch Caleb Williams and uh, Bryce Young just talk about football, you know, the transition, um, you know, going, the, the language that they use, you know, how do you identify the, the linebacker, you know, how are you shifting protections, what are you looking for? looking at the safety, looking at the structure. Just hearing them talk ball and life was really cool. And uh, you don't ever have access to that unless you're a part of that. So that's that's what makes it awesome. Especially your team, but not just them, the the general public. Because we we got a chance to watch you grow up. We got a chance to see you. You know, some people saw you in high school. They saw, uh, you know, an amazing amount saw you in college. Um, the world saw you in um, in the pros, and now we get a chance to be able to see you at a high level coaching. What do you wish that people knew about Eddie George? You know, I, I I've never been one um, to to really wish people knew more. I mean, that, that's never been anything of my concern. You know what I'm saying? Like. If, if people were to, to ask or inquire or um, or do their homework, you know, they'll ask the right questions. I mean, they'll, and they'll find out what they need to know. Uh, I, I love to have fun. Um, I have so many different interests. Um, you know, my spare time, I love to DJ. That's something that, that's been a passion of mine for years. You know, I've done that since I was, God, you know, 27 years old. And uh, I still do it because that's what I love to do. I love roller skate. I, I, I love, I love hip hop. I love fashion. I um, love to travel. I'm a big chess player. I love playing chess. Um, I love spending time with my puppies, you know, my, my English bulldog. So it's not like I wish people would know these things. You don't have to know. It's something that I want to be kept for myself, you know, because that's what I enjoy to do. Yeah. Uh, but just, um, that is, is I'm, I'm more than just you know a guy that played football and that's it that's just my world i think people label people that way like oh all you are is a basketball player you shut up and dribble or you know you don't need to be involved in social issues i mean that that's ludicrous to me we pay taxes just like everybody else and we deserve to have that voice you know you 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 need to have that voice in terms of what's happening in society so um that's, I guess that would be it. So a player on your team, Eddie, um, they have access to you like nobody else has access to you. Um, sometimes you could be a prophet in every other city but your own town. What do you wish that your players would ask you more about? Uh, I guess it would be how, how, do, how do I become a better teammate? How do I get better? How can I make this team better? What are the things that we can do to win a championship? And not just I, you know, not how can I get to the league or how can we get better? Because if we get better, you'll get better and you'll get all the opportunities that you're hoping for for yourself. 
you know, it's just buying into that mentality. So that those are the things I wish that they would probably ask more of is how we can improve. And I think we're getting there. Well, I, I congratulate you on that. And it's amazing that you said what you said about, you know, because uh, a lot of times people will just treat you as a football player. But a person listening to you today, you got to answer the questions. I can't wait for you to uh, listen back because the person that listens to this or watches this sees how incredible the person is, the person of Eddie George, not the player. And that was for me, uh, the reason why I started the podcast is because I wanted to take iconic figures like yourself and show my kids that there was no idols in life to worship, but only icons to be inspired by. And, and Eddie, right. you delivered on every level of that. Well, I'm glad I my, did. My son's name is Maddox, who is an avid right. Titans and Oilers fan, the only kid in uh, going into sixth grade that wears Oilers jerseys, wears Oilers hats, wears Titans all the time. He's a, a, a aspiring quarterback. Um, he's 11 and he has the, uh, I mean, the, the spirit that he just is, uh, marches to the beat of his own drum. My daughter is 14 years old. Her name is McKenna and she's in the theater and in the arts and she's got the most, uh, uh, you know, quick witted, uh, sarcastic personality, but just has the heart of gold. What advice would you have for Maddox who ultimately wants to play in the league and wants to play quarterback for the Titans and for McKenna coming from uncle Eddie? Oh, I, I would think, I would say, you know, keep your dreams in front of you, you know, write them down um, and, and write your goals down and live by that contract every day and, and don't and don't negotiate around it. If that's what you want to do, yeah, go get it. It's there for you. You can do whatever you want to do in life, but you have to have the focus and you can't get discouraged by the the detours that you may experience along the way on your journey. Because that detour is meant for you to see something, experience something that's going to help you for the next thing, the next, for the next, for the next test. So, um, I'm a big vision guy. You know, I would say you know, create a vision board and and uh, and and see it. Take time to cut out the papers. Be intentional about it because there's something about you doing it and the intention of putting it on the board that you're committed to that every day. It sounds kind of corny or um, it sounds like, um, you know, maybe it doesn't work, but there's something about you physically searching out the right words, the right imagery, going through the process of cutting it out, taking that double-sided tape and putting it on a board and then putting that board up that you're looking at every day, every single day. And now that you see it subconsciously, you're going to go out and prioritize your time wrapped around your dream. And that's all you want to think about. That's all you want to focus on. You know, you want to walk by faith and not by sight. You want to keep that vision in front of you. And no matter what comes your way and try to distract you from your goal, you'll always come back to that. Eddie, Eddie one last question for, uh, for you uh, is I um, originally – um, I, I'm in Park City right now. I'm uh, my studio's in San Diego. When I got the uh, call back from Katrina, and thank you so much to Katrina for setting this up. Mm -hmm. When I got the email back from her, she said, "You know, Eddie's about to go into his uh, into his season." And I knew I wouldn't be able to get you till after the season, which would be a long time. Mm -hmm. I didn't have my studio here, and my wife told me she said, "You know, with an opportunity like this, and especially the the fan that you are, and and how much you respect Eddie, make it happen no matter what." My, my ultimate was my office has the Oilers helmet in the back, has, you know, uh, Eddie's uh, Sports Illustrated cover, has everything set up. And it was, the lesson was, is sometimes the situation isn't going to be perfect. It's going to be in a situation where you just have to go and maybe it's not exactly the way that you thought it would be, but it will be exactly what it's supposed to be. So I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast. I want to thank you so much for, uh, for being here and uh, sharing your time with us. Uh, it has been an absolute, absolute pleasure. Um, and you, you are, uh, to me and to my family, uh, way more than a football uh, player. Um, Eddie, Sorry about that. Oh, no, yeah. no, no problem at all. What I was saying is, man, I, I want to tell you that 
my, my wife had told me, she said, don't worry about the studio. Cause I was worried about the studio at first because I have uh, Euler's helmet behind me. I have, you know, the, your uh, sports illustrated from 1999 where you were on the cover. I have a ball that's signed by you in, in my office. And she told me that not everything's going to turn out exactly the way that you want it to turn out. And that that is going to be God's plan as opposed to your plan. Can you speak to that a little bit as far as like, there's a way that you wanted your life to turn out, although it's been amazing, it's probably not exactly what you want it to be. And it's most of the time how you adapt to what God's will is in your life. Yeah. And I found that it's better than what I initially thought it would be. You know, um, it's, it's, you know, making your plans, but, you know, understand that he's going to direct your footsteps and, and trusting that and trusting that the fact that whatever it is that you're hoping for, dreaming for, what he has planned for you is going to be 10,000 times better than you can ever imagine. So that's, that's the key. And it's going to be what it's supposed to be and just trusting the process. And it, it goes a way that we didn't envision it. It was supposed to go that way. And just stay diligent in your work and in your vision and, and trust his plan. Eddie, I, I want to tell you, man, I, I, I appreciate you. I thank you for being on. And I'm going to force you to be my friend for the rest of your life. <laughs> I, I, I tell you, I want this. Uh, I, I would love to. And I, I love asking people. Like when I was a kid, I would ask uh, if my friend could stay the night in front of both parents. And so what I am going to ask you is I would love to have you on the podcast again at some point. And obviously not during the season because you're going to be tied up and you're going to be focused in. Um but I just want you to know that, uh, again, I'm going to force you to be my friend for the rest of your life. And you have, you have far exceeded any expectation that I've had, not from a football st player standpoint, um, but from a, uh, a human being and from a heart, uh, which has been absolutely phenomenal. So I want to thank you oh, so much. I appreciate much. it, man. You got hey, it, Kelly, man. I appreciate it.